Okay, uh, let's look at the first dynamic programming problem from CSCS. Uh, so we want to know um, how many ways there are to throw a bunch of dice such that the sum is n. Um, and every, it's a normal die from 1 to 6. Uh, so for example, to make n equals 3, you could throw a 3 ones, or you could throw a 1 and a 2, or you could throw a 2 and a 1. We're counting 1 and 2 versus 2 and 1 is different, right? There's an order. Uh, or you could just throw a 3. Um, so there's four ways, and that's what they're showing here. Uh, and so we want to know um, for n up to a million. Uh, and so they tell us nicely that this is a dynamic programming problem. Um, so the way that... OK, well, let's, let's get into coding, and I'll talk about how to do this problem. Um, so the first thing we do is the usual template. Uh, LL is in 64T. Uh, so, <laughs> read in the input, calculate the answer somehow, and then print out the uh, output. So, the way to solve, the way to start with every, every dynamic programming problem, or at least the way to think about it, is with a recursive brute force solution. Um, so, in this case, uh, how many ways are there to make n? Well, let's uh, brute force over the possibilities for the first roll which can be from 1 to 6. Uh, and uh, if, you know, if we got a 1 on the first roll, then we need to make n minus 1. Uh, right, so, so however much we got on the first roll, we need to, you know, a way to make n is to make get that on the first roll and then to make n minus that in some other, right, in any of the ways. Uh, so this is uh, a recursive brute force solution to this problem, right? So for example, if n equals three, uh, you could get one on the first roll, and then you could make two, and there's two ways to make two: one plus one or two. So that's the first case. You know, that's these two are the cases when first roll equals one. Uh, and then, or you could have two in the first roll, and then there's only one way to get one with a one. Uh, so that's the case for first roll equals two. Well, you could get three on the first roll, and then how many ways that make zero? Well, there's only one way to make zero, uh, which is do nothing. <laughs> um, or another way to put it is, you know, once you uh, hit zero, you're done. Um, and for four or more, uh, there's no ways to do it. So actually, this shows us we sort of got the recursive part right here, but we didn't get a base case right. So if n is less than 0, for example, if you roll 4, then that's impossible. Uh, you sort of gone too far down. If n equals 0, then it's just 1. Um, right, the way to make 0 is to do nothing, which you can only do in one way, sort of the mathy way to think about it. Um, and if it's more than 0, then this recursive thing will work. Um, right, so this uh, is the first step to our solution, is, is to write this recursive way of doing it with base cases and also with some recursive formula. Uh, and the logic here is that we are uh, guessing what the first roll is going to be, um, and then but looking at all possibilities of the first roll. Um, and then we need to solve the problem for some smaller n to fill out those possibilities. Uh, so the problem with this solution is that uh, it's exponential time. Right, if n is 100, uh, then there's like many, many, many ways to make 100 out of dice rolls. Uh, just thinking about like ones and twos, um, there's like Fibonacci, 100 ways to, to get 100 with 1s and 2s. Um, so this solution is going to be way too slow. Uh, also, we're going to run into overflow problems um, because there's so many ways you know, to make larger numbers. Uh, so they tell us how to, let's do the overflow problems first. They tell us to print the ways modulo 10 to the 9 plus 7. 
Uh, this is a really common thing that uh, programming homes will do is when they want to deal with big numbers, they'll often just work um, modulo some large prime. So 10 to the 9 plus 7 is, uh, is actually prime. Um, and the fact that it's prime is helpful, um, although it doesn't actually matter. I don't know why. You can trust me that it's prime, but OK. If you don't trust me, you can check Wolfram Alpha. Uh, that actually doesn't matter here, but it's helpful um, for some other things that we'll get to later. Uh, and I like to handle this by just writing a little um, some helper functions to do modular arithmetic uh, at the top of my program. Um, and then you use them like this. So this will automatically uh, you know, do it mod 10 to the 9 plus 7. Um, so, okay, so that solves the overflow problem, but it doesn't solve the too slow problem. Um, and so the, the key idea of DP is that you can take your recursive solution and you can uh, memoize it. Sounds like memorize, but it's slightly different. Memorize. Uh, this is not a typo. This is just what it's called. Um, and so the idea there is that uh, even though if you like actually look at um, sort of the call graph here, right? DP ten spawns off DP nine, DP eight, DP seven. Uh, I won't write them all, but this spawns off DP eight. DP7, DP6. Just imagine the dice are from 1 to 3, I guess. This spawns off DP7, DP6, DP5, and so on. You know, this is going to actually be very big. But the, the point is that we're calling, um, you know, the 7 is showing up a lot. Uh, and 7 is going to have this whole big subtree under it. So, like, the key idea of memorization is uh, if you already called this function with this argument, uh, just return the answer you got last time. So you uh, are going to remember previous answers. Um, right, so let's save off the answer here. Right, we can now compute the answer for n. Let's save it off. And if we already computed, the answer for n, then just return it. Um, actually, I'll. This is an optimization. Make the code a little bit shorter, but it's not as clear. Uh, right, so we have this vector, this true false of whether or not we've seen each value before, and the actual answer for that value. Um, And so we're, these are global variables, so we need to initialize them. Uh, scene should start as all false, and dp uh, will just start at all zero. It doesn't really matter because um, scene is going to make sure that we actually fill it in before we use, do anything with it. Um, yeah, so why does this work? Um, there's going to be exponentially many calls to this function, but how many? Uh, different arguments can there be? Well, n always goes down, right? n minus something between 1 and 6. And uh, if n is negative or 0, then we stop immediately. So there's only n uh, actual like possible values that we're actually going to pass this function. So this vector only needs to be n elements long. Uh, actually, it needs to go from n needs to be a valid index here, so we need n plus 1 elements. Right, this is like a zero indexing issue. Um, anyway, these vectors only need to be n elements long. And the total runtime, um, so thinking about the runtime of dp is kind of confusing if you haven't done it before, but it's actually pretty simple. Uh, the way to do it is to assume that all the recursive calls are free, and then just look at how much other work there is in each of these calls and how many uh, different possible arguments there are, right? How many total calls there are going to be. So we know that there's going to be n total calls to this function. Uh, and each call really just does a constant amount of work, right? It does this for loop over six values is the main thing, um, assuming that all these recursive calls are free. Uh, and so the total number of operations or runtime here is about just six times n. 
because uh, we're doing n calls to DP, and each call uh, I don't know, takes does six operations, right? It runs over this for loop. Six mod operations maybe is the um, critical path. This does a division, which is kind of slow. Um, so why should we think that the recursive calls are free? Well, it's just because we're counting the cost of that recursive call uh, somewhere else, right? To evaluate DP10, uh, right, you do need to evaluate DP987654, but um, the work that's, we're gonna count the cost of evaluating DP9 later. So all we need to worry about for now is the cost, you know, so just of DP10 and not, not of the recursive. Uh, calls. So anyway, the whole the total runtime here is uh, linear, uh, and um, yeah. So this is kind of a, a magic trick of memorization, right? That we used to solve DP problems. Is we started with this uh, exponential brute force, and by applying, you know, by memorizing it, we turned it into uh, linear runtime, uh, and also linear space, right? Because we have to we do have to store off the previous answers. Um, so I'll just show one more little trick, which is uh, because we know that all the answers are non-negative here, um, we can reuse this array to check whether or not we've uh, already computed the answer or not. If we start everything with negative 1, then we'll say negative 1 means like not seen. And so if the answer, if we filled in some answer, non-negative answer here, uh, then we must have already seen this value. So we actually don't need the seen array. Just, um, you know, just save some typing. And maybe some uh, some thinking. <laughs> you don't need to worry of having a second one. Ah, yes. So we do need vectors here. So let's move the vector. Uh, and we said that we didn't need scene. Right? And the point is, like this sets uh, DPN to a non-negative value. So that also tells us that we've seen it at the same time. Um, so now it compiles, and we should be able to run it. So three turns into four. A hundred turns into something. Um, but the key point is if we come out of this line, this turns off the DP, right? Uh, because now we're just always doing sort of all the recursive calls. And if we do 100 now, it'll never finish. Right? Even 10. So even at 30, it's, uh, it's going to take a while. Right? You can see the, uh, the runtime is ramping up pretty fast here. Right, 25 to 26 is already like more than twice as long, more than twice as long. Not, not sure why that didn't take more than twice as long. <laughs> Computers are weird, I guess. Uh, right, that's another, you know, twice as long. But if we turn on the memorization, instant, right, instant. It takes me, the longest part of this, by the way, is me typing in the input. Right, it takes me a little bit of time to type that in, but the actual runtime is like instant. Um, so let's uh, let's just check check our answer. This was dice. Um, so it's running through the test cases, and they are correct. Cool. Um, so yeah, that's dynamic programming. Uh, it's a really cool idea, uh, and I think this is a really clean way to think about it is, you know, first just write down the answer recursively and then apply memoization. Um, so if you can write a brute force answer, then you can do dynamic programming. Because memoization is basically this completely mechanical process. Um, right? You just add this line and this line and, you know, initialize it. Uh, and maybe you need a scene array, like if the answers could be negative or something, there's no good sentinel value. But like that's basically like a mechanical process that doesn't require any creativity um, to transform the brute force into uh, into the fast solution. Um, so I want to show another way to do DP. Um, so this is so-called top-down DP. There's also bottom-up DP, but you don't write a recursive function. Um, you just uh, you just uh, fill in the values in this array. Um, so that can be, this can be nicer 
um, sometimes. It's just a little bit faster because um, looking up an array value is faster than calling the cursor function. Um, so we're basically we're almost doing the same thing, right? We're sort of manually calling the cursor function n times. Um, so if uh, x minus d is less than 0, then 0, else dp of x minus d. Um, so this is looking up. Uh, right, so the, the recurrence here is that dp x equals dp x minus 1 plus dp x minus 2 plus dp x minus 6. So that's what we're doing here, um, except that uh, dp of negative equals 0. So you know, our, we can't pass in negative indexes into the array, so we have to do this. Um, and then we can fill in dpx equals ants, and then we can just output dpn. Uh, so we see that we get the same answer um, that we got before. It's a good sign. Um, so this is the other way to do dynamic programming, um, is instead of calling a cursor function, you actually just like explicitly fill in the DP array. Uh, I don't like this as much. I think it's a little harder to think about. And you also need to worry about um, filling in the DP array in the right order. Right, we need to fill it in from low to high here because we're actually using uh, lower values of the DP array um, in the higher values. Memorization sort of takes care of that for you. Right, You just call it recursively. Um, and if it is already filled in, then it uses that. And otherwise, it computes it. So you don't need to worry about the ordering if you're doing top down. Um, but bottom up, uh, so it's a little faster usually, um, and also you can um, you can like save uh, memory space sometimes. Um, hopefully, we'll we'll probably see that later. I don't want to talk about it now. Um, but anyway, those are the two two ways to do DP. But I really recommend starting with with the top down one. Um, it's easier to think about, I think. Uh, so let's submit that too. Just to make sure. You know, I'll prove to you that both of these are, are reasonable ways to do it. Cool. Uh, so that's that's dynamic program. Um, really useful, really uh, really neat idea.